in, in my presentation, I will be talking about the Zeter uh, Bewegung orbit of the electrons. This is a, a new wave function of the electrons that uh, I believe is now for the first time can be recognized. So the structure of the talk is that I first um, talk about background and motivation, then uh, theoretic foundations, the calculation, and comparison against uh, experimental data. And so this uh, background motivation is uh, uh, related to the talk that I presented at ICCF 21 last year. Um, uh, let's uh, consider what is already a well-known phenomenon in the muon-catalyzed uh, PD fusion. Um, there it has been already in the 1950s observed that in some cases the muons uh, will carry away all the nuclear reaction energy. This is the 5.6 uh, MEP muons that are uh, produced. Um, now the equivalent uh, of, uh, for the electrons has been observed in a Lipovlachet study only in 2017, 2000, uh, two years ago. So there, uh, the group observed that when they did PD fusion in graphite, then certain electrons were uh, carrying away uh, all of the uh, 5.6 MeV uh, reaction energy. So uh, this uh, observation uh, points to the existence of an electron uh, wave function with very close uh, electron uh, nucleus proximity, which uh, allows then the electron to uh, carry a very nuclear uh, reaction energy. And uh, the reason why I got uh, interested in this field is that in our own experiments we uh, have uh, uh, signals which can be interpreted as uh, Bremsstrahlung of uh, particles. So what we observe is uh, in uh, our reactions, we observe the RF uh, uh, background to rise uniformly. And at the same time, we had the uh, Geiger counting at the readings about 40 times the background. And uh, these are uh, characteristics, uh, can be characteristics of Bremsstrahlung. So uh, I was interested in, in this topic, uh, first to explain what we saw in our experiments. Now, from uh, the data of the uh, reproduction study, we can right away get a crude order of magnitude estimate of this wave function we're looking for, because in the muon catalyzed fusion, the muon takes away reaction energy in 15% of the cases, and uh, the muon is about 250 femtometers uh, from the nucleus. In the um, uh, reproduction study, they saw the electron taking away about 7% of the cases, the reaction energy. So then, uh, just as a very crude interpolation, we are uh, looking for uh, an orbit that's about uh, 500 femtometers, just as an order of magnitude uh, estimation. Now, my uh, calculation is uh, fairly simple, but to understand the calculation, you have to understand uh, the uh, foundations. And the foundations are, uh, are not uh, uh, so straightforward, um, at least uh, in the first sight. And uh, this uh, prompted me uh, with some co-authors to write a book. Uh, so uh, if you're interested, you can ask me about the book where the foundation is uh, described uh, properly. But now I try to present you in five minutes <laughs> how I can to condense the book. Uh, so the, uh, the main point is that uh, we start from uh, investigating Maxwell equation and talk about consequences of Maxwell equation. Now, uh, you might be wondering, you know, why I talk about Maxwell equation, we all learn about it in, in high school already. Well, we uh, learn in the high school about the uh, certain version of Maxwell equation, but uh, I think uh, we achieved only very recently to properly understand how to write down the Maxwell equation as a field equation. So the key is that the uh, algebra of the relativistic space-time that we live in is the Clifford algebra. And uh, so to write Maxwell equation properly, we have to work in Clifford algebra. And moreover, we want to write it as a field equation. So when you write it as a field equation, then you look for objects that incorporate uh, 
electric fields, currents, and charges. And uh, the breakthrough, uh, in my view, was done by these three gentlemen, uh, uh, Dr. Celani, Vasalo, and Di Tommaso. So they published in 2017 uh, the Maxwell's Equation and Occam Racer's article, which I encourage everyone to read. And I think it's a historic achievement that this is the first time that uh, Maxwell's equation is written as a proper uh, relativistic field equation. Uh, so now that we know how Maxwell equation really looks like, uh, this is by the way a simple geometric picture. So if A is the vector potential and G are the uh, electromagnetic fields, then really what Maxwell equation is saying is that you take the space-time derivative of vector potential, you get the fields, you take space-time derivative of fields and you get zero. So this is the simple geometric uh, picture. Okay, but uh, uh, what are the consequences? There are some uh, remarkable consequences and I uh, would like to just uh, very briefly name the most important one. First, uh, the uh, electromagnetic Lagrangian is the simplest uh, relativistically allowed uh, Lagrangian formation. And in some general relativity books, you can uh, read how uh, Lagrangian can be derived from uh, uh, relativistic variation principles. So for example, in this book, the authors derive what's the simplest Lagrangian, and it's this type of expression, uh, and this is indeed what we found, and it's a bit uh, simpler than the traditional electromagnetic Lagrangian. The, the other consequence is that if you take Maxwell equation with the uh, energy momentum square equals mass square condition, then this leads directly to the Dirac equation. Uh, we are actually not the first ones to recognize that. There is some literature to the so-called optical Dirac equation, and the optical Dirac equation is looks, looking at uh, this type of equivalence in the case where there is no charges. But we can generalize this method from the case that there is no charges to the any particle case, so, so we see the equivalence of Maxwell's equation plus this relativistic condition with Dirac equation. And I would like to emphasize this because, um, of course, many physicists say that whenever you look for a wave function, you have to look for solutions of the Dirac equation. And what we are doing is not in contradiction to that because uh, uh, the solutions that we get from our method are actually automatically also solutions of the Dirac equation. So I wanted to make that uh, clear. And um, other important consequence is that we know what charges are made of. Charges and fields are the same thing. And we know what is mass is made of. Mass is just electromagnetic energy momentum. So we really have some more clear view of some fundamental questions. Then uh, we can recognize some uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, connections between electromagnetism and quantum mechanics. But there are two key points I would like to emphasize. So the uh, quantum mechanical probability density uh, is uh, the uh, same thing as electromagnetic Lagrangian density, and this is a nice thing. So we have the wave function developing according to the Lagrangian, which is, uh, happens to be Lorentz invariant, and uh, this happens uh, uh, in the case where the scalar field is zero. So what we see is that the gauge invariance is a property of the quantum mechanical wave function, but it's not doesn't have to be an actual symmetry of the electromagnetism. The other uh, important consequence that I will use in my talk is that we need to have a more sophisticated understanding of Heisenberg uncertainty. In our understanding, Heisenberg uncertainty applies only to those oscillation modes of the wave function which exist. So uh, electrons of particle can have uh, internal and orbital oscillations, and uh, in the ordinary wave function, uh, there is more oscillation modes uh, than in the general solution. So you can have different solutions of the wave function with different modes existing or not existing, and you cannot apply the uncertainty principle to those oscillation modes which do not exist, only to those which, which are actually present in the solution. Uh, so based on these uh, principles, um, 
Giorgio Rosalo and uh, Di Tommaso calculated the electron structure. So very briefly what the uh, electron model is, is that you have a spherical charge surface and it has a radius of the classic electron radius. It has a zeta radial motion at the speed of light and this radius at which it moves around is uh, the zeta gravedum radius, this is the reduced quantum radius. And you can recognize a, a scaling, geometric scaling between the charge radius, zeta gravedum radius and the Bohr radius. And uh, this uh, geometric scaling factor alpha is the electromagnetic fine structure constant. So, uh, and uh, other important point, there's enough there is equal amount of electric and magnetic field energy in the solution. So if you follow the consequences of the Maxwell equation, this is the electron model you end up with. And uh, what I would like to emphasize about this model is that these are the values in the uh, rest frame of the electron. But if uh, the electron uh, moves at some energy, then all of these values change and uh, there is this relativistic shift. Uh, but the change is uh, described by a very simple formula. So uh, if you have a higher uh, energy of the electromagnetic field, then the proportional factor is just one over R. So for example, if you have two times the electron energy than in the rest frame, then all of these uh, values of the electron size shift by half. So it's a very simple linear relationship. Uh, okay, and then with this background, we can finally come to the concept of the uh, zeta gravedum orbit. So what uh, I was considering is uh, can this uh, zeta gravedum state of the electron uh, realize as an orbit around the nucleus? So in that case, the uh, electron's main distance from the nucleus would be approximately the zeta gravedum radius. Uh, and, uh, so you can see in this picture what happens, that the electron charge moves around on this orbit and you have this strong magnetic field in the center and the nucleus is then in the center of this magnetic dipole field. Uh, now uh, let's uh, consider the, the energy uh, balances. So uh, when uh, the electron is at this distance r from the nucleus, then it has the electric potential energy and the electric potential energy is described by this uh, uh, simple formula. So at the uh, zeta gravedum orbit radius I showed you before, uh, the potential energy is about 3.7 kilo electron volts. And if it's closer, then the actual potential energy is proportionally uh, larger than this default value. Uh, now, <clears throat> How does the uh, electromagnetic uh, field energy of the electron change? A uh, very simple calculation would be to say that the electron is somewhere far away at uh, standstill, and from this uh, stationary electron, we just let it to fall into the potential field of the nucleus. So in that case, the uh, difference of the electromagnetic field energy would be just equal of the potential uh, energy. But uh, actually we, can, we need to, to consider it more generally the problem because in the beginning the electron does not have to be standstill. The electron can have a kinetic energy in the beginning, so that's the total energy. And in this talk the total energy is uh, the uh, kinetic energy of the electron where it's at some far away initial state. So, so because this total energy is an unknown term, uh, we cannot solve yet uh, this uh, equation. We need a further uh, condition because as you can see, depending on the total energy, uh, we can have any solution at any radius. But one important thing that I would like to point uh, out is that this solution about the uh, standstill uh, uh, zeta bewegung, it fulfills the Heisenberg uncertainty because the zeta bewegung solution itself fulfills the Heisenberg uncertainty and the oscillation in the orthogonal direction is not present. So, so <clears throat> this uh, uh, simple uh, calculation is something that fulfills the Heisenberg uncertainty, 
but what it does not fulfill is the uh, virial theorem condition because uh, there is uh, no particle-like movement of the of the electron. So, and and we know <clears throat> that uh, for any stable orbit, uh, there is a relationship between kinetic and potential energy given by virial theorem. So. Uh, let's consider some solution which actually fulfills the virial theorem as well. The solution that we will look for is a solution where this plane is rotating. So, <clears throat> so the electron has its uh, zeta bewegung speed along this direction, and it has a rotational speed along the other direction, so it becomes a rotating plane. <clears throat> Uh, okay, and this is how uh, the speeds decompose. Uh, the consequence <coughs> of the Maxwell's equations is that the uh, local speed of the electric charge is always the speed of light. <coughs> and when the electron has some kinetic energy, uh, then the speed decomposes into two directions. One is the uh, speed along the zeta bewegung oscillation, the other one is the speed in uh, orthogonal to it, and this speed is the uh, speed of the particle which gives it the kinetic energy. So, so I uh, label it as these two terms, the uh, wave speed and the kinetic speed, and uh, uh, the electromagnetic energy of the zeta bewegung wave is proportional to this speed. So, so you can see that from the uh, energy I had in the previous slide, uh, this energy is reduced by this proportionality uh, factor. So, uh, so this energy of the wave is uh, less than the energy that we had before because the speed is less in the zeta wave interaction. On the other hand, it gains uh, kinetic energy. So if we compare, sorry, if we compare the energy of uh, this uh, uh, solution, which is uh, standing still, against the energy of the uh, rotating solution, then uh, the difference between these two energies is what I call delta E in the presentation. Right? And it comes from these two terms. Uh, on the one hand, we have the wave and the kinetic energy, and minus the energy that I had on the previous slide. And, <clears throat> and please remember that the energy I had on the previous slide is the one that fulfills the Heisenberg uncertainty. Uh, okay, now we know what is the wave energy term, we don't know yet what is the kinetic energy term. So this is where we apply the Virial theorem, and we have to apply the relativistic uh, uh, Virial uh, theorem, because the speeds are, are in the relativistic regime. Now, in many textbooks, the uh, relativistic formula is written without the square. So gamma over uh, gamma plus one. But uh, that uh, formula is valid only for uh, straight motion. When you're rotating, your motion is definitely not straight, it's circular, and for circular motion, you need to take into account the Thomas precession effect. So if you do the calculation, then this uh, uh, relativistic factor comes out gamma squared over gamma uh, plus one. Uh, all right, so now uh, I chart here. Uh, what is the uh, solution of the uh, total energy uh, as a uh, no? Yeah, what is the, the total energy as a function of the radius r at which this rotation uh, happens? And uh, this uh, uh, green line is the line that uh, uh, is the solution to the uh, virial theorem coming from the previous slide. So as you can see, we still don't know how far the electron is from the nucleus, because uh, depending on the kinetic energy it had in the very beginning, uh, it can have uh, various uh, distances from the nucleus, which all fulfill the virial theorem. Uh, however, there is uh, one uh, special place, and uh, the special place is where the delta E equals zero. So delta E equals zero is the place where the uh, energy of the rotating state is the same as the energy of the non-rotating state. And you can remember that uh, this uh, delta E equals zero is the place where uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty condition is fulfilled. So that's the quantization condition in this case. 
so we have among all the values which fulfill the real theorem, one special value which uh, uh, fulfills the quantization condition in, in this case. Uh, so we are almost at the solution. There is one more thing we have to consider. We have to consider the uh, magnetic interaction with the nucleus. Uh, so uh, the nucleus uh, is in the magnetic field of the electron, which is quite strong. So the nucleus will experience a Zeeman split. And that's a good thing because it will assume the lower energy in the Zeeman split and this will be a stabilizing force. Uh, on the other hand, the nucleus itself has a magnetic uh, dipole moment. So the electron feels the magnetic uh, field of the nucleus uh, and it moves around in the circle in the field that's vertical, so the Lorentz force will be radial. So the uh, magnetic uh, field of the nucleus will add a small radial contribution that we have to consider in the virial theorem solution. Now, that uh, contribution of the magnetic field is quite small, but uh, nevertheless, it uh, makes a significant difference in uh, uh, where the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty condition is fulfilled. So this slide shows our final solution. So again, the green line is the solution where the VRL condition is fulfilled. This uh, point here is where the delta energy equals zero, and this corresponds to the uh, fulfillment of the Heisenberg uncertainty condition. Uh, all right, so we have uh, one special point that looks like a unique solution, and uh, you can see that the total energy is, is more than zero. So what it means? It means that uh, this is a metastable state. And it's a very good news that the solution is not somewhere here, because uh, if the total energy would be significantly negative, then this would be the ground state of the hydrogen and it would not be here. So you have to uh, say this relativistic effect that we are here and this is positive. Um, so now let's uh, look numerically what the calculation says. And uh, this is the... Uh, 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 my calculation for the total electron energy in the beginning uh, from which you get these uh, stable transitions. So as you can see, the total energy depends on which isotope of the hydrogen you talk about and the difference is the uh, different uh, magnetic field of the nucleus. Uh, so for the uh, zeta gradient orbit around the proton, the total energy is uh, 81 electron volts and for zeta gradient orbit around the delta zone, uh, we have 35 electron volts. Uh, and um, uh, what this means is that this is the initial kinetic energy. What is important is that this kinetic energy does not have to be a free electron. It can also be coming from kinetic energy of an electron orbital. Only important thing is that this is the initial electron kinetic energy. Okay, so. So these uh, are some practical values we have, and now we can try to look at the validation, whether this calculation is correct or not. So the, the first thing that we look at is those materials where we find electron orbitals with uh, close to uh, 80 electron volt kinetic energy. Uh, so I have uh, charted here the, some transition metals and bromine and uh, I have uh, shown in the graph for different elements the energy of that electron orbital, which is closest to 80. And uh, what we actually want to see is those elements which are slightly below this line, because if you're slightly below the line, you can excite uh, the electron up, but if you're above the line, it's hard to take energy away from the electron. Uh, so, so interestingly, nickel is uh, quite close, just below 80. Uh, and I could give you, you know, many references for nickel hydrogen systems. Many of you have that in your lab. I choose here the Foucault D reference because he was working with plain nickel. So in that case, there is no other elements. It, it was just nickel hydrogen. Uh, the other interesting uh, report is uh, this uh, report by a Chinese group uh, where they observed the transmutation 
uh, of elements uh, where the transmutation seemed to have uh, cached one proton. It was in aqueous environment. Uh, and uh, in their case, they had a bromine-based uh, catalyst. So that uh, report implies that bromine works, and we indeed see the electron close to 80 electron volts. Now, if this calculation is true, then it means that we have a method to somehow rationally find uh, those LNR materials that work. So uh, according to calculation, at least uh, cobalt and vanadium are also pretty close, so they should be uh, suitable LNR reactor materials as well. Now, let's take a look at uh, uh, deuteron. Uh, so in case of deuteron, I have uh, uh, calculated 35 electron volt, and now I look at calcium. And in calcium, you can indeed see uh, orbitals with very close to 35 electron volt kinetic energy. And uh, here I uh, would like to uh, mention Dr. Iwamura's experiments, which were replicated by another uh, Japanese uh, group. Uh, and they show uh, calcium-based material catalyzing transmutation when deuterium is present. And in the replication experiments, it was specially tested for hydrogen, and it was found that this transmutation works only with deuterium, not with hydrogen. So this, uh, again, points to uh, a validation of our calculation that the certified electron volt is only relevant for deuterium, not relevant for, for hydrogen-based uh, materials. Now, uh, the best type of validation would come from a system where you only have protons and electrons or only deuterons and electrons, hydrogen, nothing else, then we can exclude some other materials. And uh, this seems to come from cold fusion experiments. Uh, now, did you know that cold fusion people also do LNR reactions? <laughs> you might be surprised, but that, that is the case. It's called uh, runaway electrons. So what happens is that um, in uh, some tokamak experiments, uh, they notice that something unexpected happens when the plasma temperature cools. So here you see at the beginning uh, some uh, plasma state, and they inject a pump. So they just add additional uh, uh, gas uh, molecules. It's a deuterium-based plasma. And at t equals zero, so then the uh, density of the plasma increases and the energy of it goes down because this gas they inject is cooling it. And what they observe is that when the uh, plasma energy cools to a certain level, suddenly it starts to eject very energetic electrons. And in some uh, experiments that I reference here, uh, they show this uh, electron spectrum, and they measure electron energies up to 15 mega electron volts. So this is deuterium plasma, and you know, in deuterium we can have, of course, deuterium deuterium fusion. Uh, now, what do hot fusion people do when they observe 15 mega electron volt electrons that they cannot explain? Well, they say it's not nuclear, of course. <laughs> so if you want to read some good humor, you can read how they explain uh, that this is not nuclear. But for our presentation, we consider that this is nuclear. Uh, uh, another experiment that I reference here is the same thing. You have a plasma, it's a disruption then uh, the uh, plasma temperature cools, which is measured by the lowering current, and then there is a plateau forming. And uh, so during this plateau, something happens that, that stops for some time, the fall of the plasma temperature, and at the same time, you have very energetic electrons being produced, and this is a neutron detector that detects uh, neutrons produced by these very energetic uh, uh, electrons. And, um, what would be the most relevant is to measure the plasma temperature in this uh, plateau. Because if my theory is correct, then it means that the plasma temperature here should be approximately 35 electron volt. Now, I did not find any literature where this was measured. Uh, and if you have any hot fusion friends, please ask them to, to measure this. Uh, but the closest I was finding is uh, this uh, article I reference here, where they, based on reactor parameters, they estimated the plasma temperature here in this regime, and their estimation was 42 electron volts, which is not bad, it's fairly close to the 35 electron volts which I calculated. 
Uh, then uh, next one is the uh, production of elect uh, energetic electrons in palladium deuterium systems. So we are, we are getting back to LNR again. And uh, what we see in the photo is uh, three-fold track uh, patterns of the carbon breakup uh, that was uh, observed by Pamela Mosier Bos during uh, palladium deuterium co evolution experiments. So it was established already, as you know, that the main reaction in palladium uh, deuterium is the deuterium deuterium fusion. And in that case, there is nothing um, uh, that could, uh, other than uh, gamma photons, take away the energy, except if you have an energetic electron emission. Uh, now, to observe these uh, carbon breakup tracks, you need uh, some particles with at least 7 red electron volt uh, energy. And uh, this uh, again corresponds to the model. So, if we have electrons carrying away the uh, 20 mega electron volts of the uh, deuterium deuterium fusion, they certainly have this high energy to break up carbon particles. Now, next uh, validation is the non thermal. Uh, did I have to stop here? Okay, just I'd wrap up in one minute. Uh, so, in, uh, also in palladium deuterium uh, systems, non thermal infrared emission was observed. Here you can see uh, frames of this infrared emission one second apart. And uh, this was also by Mitchell Schwartz observed and other experiments. Uh, now, uh, from my calculation, you can say what is the frequency, what should be the frequency, because this uh, light is emitted by the nucleus due to the Zeeman splitting. So I told you that the nucleus is in the strong magnetic field of the electron and its energy undergoes Zeeman splitting and from Zeeman splitting you can calculate that in proton case the uh, 700 terahertz is the frequency of emitted photons and in delta case 200 uh, terahertz frequency. So I would really love for somebody to uh, measure this so as far as I know, these frequencies were not measured yet, and I was very happy in Dr. Kasagi's presentation yesterday that uh, his group is planning to do spectroscopic analysis. My request, please look for the 700 terahertz peak. Uh, that's a prediction. Uh, and for palladium deuterium system, please look for the 210 terahertz peak. Uh, yeah, then uh, I, skip, I have to skip over this slide. So this is the Holmlitz ultra dense uh, hydrogen. It turns out that the nucleus nucleus distance that they measured, this 2.3 picometers, uh, is corresponding to our model. So the Holmlitz ultra dense hydrogen is actually the same zeta wave orbit, but with magnetic interaction between them. Uh, so this is the conclusion that uh, we can understand this new. Uh, wave function of the electron state, and this seems to be experimentally appearing in many different exclusion, accelerator experiments, transmutation, LNR reactors, ultra dense hydrogen. So it could be something that's uh, uh, quite common to LNR, and I, I hope in the future there will be many validating experiments to this calculation. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we've consumed all of the discussion time. I'll take one urgent and short question. If your question sounds too long, I'll simply shut you up. I'm missing one serious point. We you know that the store of magnetic energy at the ball level is 0 0.057 electron volts. Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. That the store of magnetic energy. If an electron moves around the nucleus, that is generated the magnetic field, that contains energy. Yes. And at this level you show here, it's already some hundred electron volts. And this is a huge factor you just neglect. Oh, oh uh, as I showed in the presentation slides earlier, the uh, electron's energy is half electric field energy, half magnetic field energy. So uh, this is always, when you have an electromagnetic wave, always half of the energy of the wave is magnetic and half is electric, and this is exactly uh, what is in our electron model. Thank you very much. I'm just going to conclude the discussion at this point and invite the next speaker, Dr. Kaneyaga Hanagaya, to the uh, podium.